Welcome to the Working Money Podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Wong. I'm your co-host, Willie Morales. Each week, we talk to people, either on the internet, through the phone, or in person. We try to get the best business minds on this podcast. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe on iTunes, and please enjoy the show. We have Hugh Zareski. Uh, he was a real estate expert, technology specialist, and a distinguished author. And definitely, Hugh, I want to talk about your books. Uh, Hugh has been a uh, has trained over 1,000 real estate investors and spoken for many uh, national organizations. And Hugh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh no, thank you guys for the opportunity to share some knowledge with all your great listeners. Uh, I am born and raised in New York, even though I don't sound like it. <laughs> I grew up out in Strong Island, and, uh, you know, my parents were teachers. They told me to study hard, get a good education like most people, but my parents had time freedom being teachers. They did not have financial freedom. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I can tell you more stories about uh, camping across the U.S. because every couple of years we used to rent our house out to people from New York City that wanted to come out and live near, you know, be near a beach for a summer. And that's how my parents were able to afford to pay the real estate taxes. As most people know, Nassau and Suffolk County are some of the most expensive places to live in all of the country, according to Fortune magazine. So when we got to hotels, our relatives were staying at really nice hotels, and we were at the you know, Super 8 with the outdoor pool. So I said, hey, what do their parents do? And they all worked in corporate America. So I made the financial assumption that I should go into the corporate world. And went into IT, became, you know, went into programming, databases, worked my way up through uh, the IT world, became the under director of technology for a company called Getty Images, mm-hmm. and uh, was tired of my hour and a half commute in from Long Island, so decided to move into New York City on September 1st, 2001. I moved into my apartment, and less than 10 days later, both planes flew over. Uh, the building that I worked at at Giddy Images, and right into the Twin Towers. My office actually oh, wow. looked right out into into the Twin Towers. And that's the day that changed my life. I know it changed a lot of New Yorkers' lives. It changed a lot of American lives across the country. And, you know, watching that out my window really made me think differently. Now, back then, nobody had cell phone cameras. Uh, so it, our photographers all went running down to the scene. For those of you guys that know Giddy Images, you know, they, they do stock photography, uh, news, sports, paparazzi, and cover all the latest and greatest events out there. And the photographers went running down to the scene. The only digital camera that was available was in the facilities department, so I grabbed it from the facilities team. I ran it over to the picture desk. Uh, they said, take it to the roof to give it to one of our photographers. So I ran up there with one of the picture desk editors to the roof. When we got there, there was no photographer there. Uh, so I was the first wow. one to take pictures of the scene that went out to every major newspaper. But mm-hmm. I watched out my window that day uh, the hopes and dreams of a lot of people going to work and never got a chance to fill it. So I, needed, I, so I realized I needed to change the way I thought. Right? A lot of people are grown up in that scarcity model, that save for the future, save for the future, you'll have a better life. And that's the model definitely that I was in. Right? Save for retirement account, build your portfolio so you have money in the future. And that day made me stop and, and take a look and I got invited to a real estate investor meeting back in 2003 I learned one little real estate investment strategy I made a hundred thousand dollars on my first real estate deal here in New York City and I thought I got lucky so I said I need to learn a little more so I continued my training and education and in 2005 I walked in and fired my boss I haven't had nice. a real job since then I've been a full-time real estate investor now we're up to having trained over 10,000 real estate investors across the country in all 50 states and working on real estate deals nationwide with a lot of our team members. Before we go on, I just want to thank all of our military veterans and first responders because they've seen things way worse than I did that day. Yeah, and, definitely. You know, and hopefully a lot of your listeners haven't gone through something like that, but they've definitely gone through something personal. You guys are going through something personal. That are, that's why you're on this webinar listening to entrepreneurs. That's why you're on this podcast because you – have something going on in your life that is changing and you know you need to to make that change to continue to generate the income you need in today's world you know though you it, it's amazing that you were able to to see that you were able to focus on what was ahead and what was behind you but what it, what is it though or maybe you can answer this. I know this might be a difficult question but why why is it that some people tend to be stuck 
some people get stuck in their comfort zone, right? Uh, you know, when we go through life, you know, as a kid, you have lots of dreams. As you grow up, you know, oftentimes your dreams get squished and squashed by people, even though they don't mean to or intend to do it. And we feel like we get ourselves stuck into certain situations. And people become disconcerted. Um, you know, they sort of lose that, that faith. They sort of lose that goal behind what they're doing. And they start to settle. And once they start to settle, they start to settle in until something happens in their life that forces them to stretch outside their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And for most adults, it only happens, you know, every three to five years. Right? A lot of people have tried a new business, maybe real estate investing before, but, you know, they may start at it and then they, you know, they have a setback or a failure and they drop out for three to five years. And it takes them three to five years to build back up that courage again. So instead of, you know, thinking of it like a baby, you know, of course, when you start a new business, it's not going to go great the first time. Of course, it's not going to, you know, be a home run the first time you get up to ever hit a baseball, right? We all know those things, but we don't allow ourselves those small little failures in life that you're going to try something that doesn't work, you're going to try something that doesn't work, you're going to try something that doesn't work, and then boom, you apply all that and it takes off. It's better to fail forward than fail backwards. Some people don't have the patience. They think that it's something that you can do, you know, overnight. Yeah, everybody wants the fast money. And truly, if you're starting a business, you're starting a real estate career, right, it's not fast money. It's a slow growth into it. So I never tell people, you know, when they start, like, real estate investing, don't fire your boss tomorrow. So let's build your income so that you can go fire your boss. Right. I started in 2003. I didn't fire my boss till 2005. Now we've got people that start with us and now in 30 days are able to fire their boss, but it really depends on the income that you need to replace. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to quit your job. You don't want to stop what you're doing until you replace that income. So we always talk about you know, uh, starting your business part-time, and then eventually you'll go full-time because it will, it, you'll realize that it costs you more money to stay – you know, go to work than it does to stay home. If you were to stay home, you would actually make more money than your job. But you've got to have that mindset that you're going to pay a little bit. You know, you're not going to go out as much. You're not going to do some of the things that your friends are doing now so that you can enjoy a better life. So, you know, a lot of people say, I'd rather pay now and play later than pay now and pay later because it doesn't get any better in life, right? The sooner you make that change, they're not teaching you how to become you know, a millionaire at your job. They're not teaching you how to become a business owner at your job. They're teaching you how to do your job. Right. All right. And it's that, that thought process that I don't want anybody to control my income. Going from a nine to five to becoming a, you know, a, a full-time entrepreneur, how was the transition? Was it an easy transition? Was it a difficult one? It's easier if you still have a job, right? And I kept my day job. Uh, I guess I've always been one of those people that always had my day job and then I did something on the side, you know, growing up, I started working in restaurants when I was 16 years old and I would continue to go back and bartend and do those things because I knew I always had that philosophy that while I was single, you know, I can go out there and make a whole bunch of money. I'll make the sacrifices now that I could live off my bartending money and bank my paycheck. So for me, the process is that you're going to have to sacrifice something. The choice of sacrificing now or later. And I'd rather sacrifice now so that I don't have to have somebody in the future tell me when I have to wake up. No, you know, don't tell me I don't have enough PTO. I don't have that. So you have to prepare yourself that you're going to make some sacrifices now. So the sacrifices will be worth it over time. So I didn't go out as much. You know, I had to take the time after work hours to – be building my business to make that transition. And we call it the emotional roller coaster. Uh, if everybody, anybody's ever gone into a sales job, if anybody's ever tried to start a business before, always expect that it will take longer than your plan and there will be more ups and downs in it than you ever expected. Uh, we call it the emotional roller coaster because, you know, at your job, whether you do a great job, you do an average job, you do an okay job, you still get paid, right? you're not in the sales profession, if you're just showing up every day, doing your job, right? As long as you do your job, you get paid. That doesn't happen as an entrepreneur, right? If you're just doing okay, you may not get paid, right? You've got to put in that extra effort, that extra, and, you know, and when you start any business, you've got the highs and the lows of it. 
right? You're like, oh, I got this great big order coming in and then it doesn't happen. Oh, I'm going to close this big real estate deal and then something happens and screws it up. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen. So it's an emotional roller coaster. You've got these highs and lows. And it takes a bit of time to get used to that and to build your internal fortitude, right? That internal fortitude that you're not going to get too high, you're not going to get too low, right? Hey, I got a million dollar deal. Up oh, now it's gone. Hey, you know, I could make 50 grand on this. Up oh, now it's gone, right? There's that ups and downs of the business that until you start building that base and you start building that stream, uh, then those highs and lows smooth out. And your highs get higher and your lows get higher. What I mean by that, right? Your income may start out at like $500 a month and then you got the potential to make 10 grand and then you know what? You stay in that for a little bit, but eventually now your low becomes 1,000 and your high may become 15,000, right? And now you're in that wave pattern in between those two numbers. So eventually it just starts creeping up to the point where you're at that point where you can fire your boss and walk away from your job, whether that's a new entrepreneur business, whether that's real estate income coming in, you start to build that pipeline. And it does take time. So it, it always takes probably double the amount of time that you want. And just be prepared that it's going to take longer than you expected. So just have that built into your plan. That's why I stayed at my job for two years. I wanted to make sure I had the income and the skills that I needed and built and tested and had fell forward, as you said, a bunch of times before I, I, I gave up that, you know, paycheck. Mm, that's good advice. Yeah, and too many people set deadlines on themselves. They're like, hey, I got to do it in the next 30 days, 90 days. I got to generate this. And it's never in that time frame because everybody has a different skill set. And you've got to, you know, you're, you got to, it, it depends on you when it clicks on building those skills. That's priceless. And, and, that, and hopefully people that listen to the show would take that and say, hey, okay, ups and downs happen. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you, I, I have a question for you. Um, out of your experiences doing real estate, what do you recall was a struggle point and what was a highlight? So there's been lots of struggle points. Um, you know, getting started, learning how to raise capital was a struggle point. You know, being able to talk to sellers and buyers and I had made presentations to Wall Street. You know, we we'd, um, you said we were a publicly traded company, so we had Wall Street executives coming in. We had to talk about, you know, analysts coming in and say, why is your company worth this? Tell us what you're doing with the IT program, those type of things. So I'd always made those types of presentations, but I had never made presentations to somebody saying, hey, give me 250000 Hey, give me a half million dollars to go ahead and invest. So that was one of the first struggle points, right, as you started to invest, saying, okay, now I need to raise capital. I need people to invest in me. How can I communicate that to them? So that was a big struggle point. Um, when the market crashed, because I've been doing this full time since 2005, you know, when the market crashed and a lot of our properties crashed and trying to make sure, you know, keeping them above water, doing what we can to sort of survive during that. And, you know, everybody's got to go through their learning experience. So, you know, we went through that learning experience 2008, 2009, 2010, just keeping the business going during that time frame was a struggle, right? Because nobody wanted anything to do with real estate. Nobody wanted, you know, real estate was bad. Real estate was bad, even though it was one of the best times ever to be buying real estate. It right? required 186 units in an 18-month period during that time, but everybody wanted nothing to do with real estate. You know, and it was hard to convey to people. So just keeping the business afloat during the crash was a struggle. Um, you know, and that's just you know, business struggles, and then your personal life. As an entrepreneur, your personal life, you know, whatever's going on relationship-wise, those type of things. You know, I got married two years ago. Uh, my wife moving out from Utah with her two kids. That was, you know, a bit of a struggle trying to blend business, family now uh, right. into the occasion. So there's been lots of different struggles with it and just trying to make it through the process. Uh, you're going to constantly struggle. You're, you know, you're going to go up and down, constantly struggle with it. But it's learning from each one of those. So um, those three, I would, I would say, were the big ones. 
of being able to get money from you know being able to raise capital. That's a, a big skill that you need to learn how to how to do. Uh, be able to maintain your business during the downtime, right? What's your backup plan? You know, we teach all of our investors to make sure they have three exit strategies on each one because so we want to make sure that there is a backup plan on that, right? Everybody goes in, the market's great, you can fix and flip properties all day long, but when the market crashes, what are you going to do? And that was a huge learning lesson for us. And then, you know, being able to separate your personal life as an entrepreneur from the business is another one. Uh, being able to keep those emotions separate and be able to focus on your business even when things aren't going the best in your personal life um, or you're having struggles or things are going on. Now for one of the biggest successes that I've had, and it's funny because you know we've done million dollar deals, we've done $4.5 million deals, but one of my first deals is one of the ones that, you know, uh, and I always get emotional on this one because it, it, it was an emotional story of helping somebody out of a bad situation and being able to save somebody. And most people think real estate investing is about making money. And guys, you're going to make money at it, right? Once you learn the skills, once you understand how to do it, you're going to make money. That's, that's, that's a no-brainer on there. But, you know, it's really about helping people. And the more people you help, the more money you will make. And so... One of the deals that I did, and this goes back a few years, and so I'm a little hazy on the numbers exactly, but uh, you know, I was I had fired my boss. I was going full, I was full time in real estate, and I got a phone call from a friend of the family that said, "Hey, Hugh, uh, hey, I hear you're doing that real estate thing. Look, we got a bad financial situation. Do you think you could help?" Now you know when you get inv involved with family or friends of family and. There's a real estate situation going on. They always want to help, but oftentimes there's not really an opportunity to. And I was flying out to train some investors uh, two days later. So I think I got the phone call on like Monday, and I was, or sorry, I got a phone call on Tuesday, and I was flying Tuesday. And they said, "Look, uh, you know uh, th this family member of ours. She's been a great person. She always takes care of everybody else." but she doesn't have a plan to take care of herself. Uh, she didn't have any kids, you know. Uh, so to make a long story short, she had been diagnosed with, um, she had a myeloma on her leg. And she, she was only given about a week to live. And oh, she had wow. to move out of her house and into a hospice. And she'd been sick for a while. Uh, people had been taking care of her. But she was one of those people that took care of everybody else but didn't have a plan for herself, right? She didn't have any savings. She didn't have anything. She was always giving her money away to other people. And I said, you know, she's only got about a week to live, and there isn't even enough money for the funeral. So they said, if there's anything you can do to help us out, that we can go ahead and, you know, get this property sold. Because they're like, it takes 90 days to sell a property in this area. That was a rural part of North Carolina. It takes about 90 days to sell a property. So now they've only got a week to sell a property that would normally take 90 days. Um, so I said, you know, I, I can't even come down there and take a look at it. I'm, I'm planning to fly out. So, that, you know, I can take a look at the numbers, but I can't promise you anything. Mm -hmm. So we had them go take pictures. Uh, I was able to run numbers using software. I didn't have to go see the property. I could determine what it was worth. And, you know, it was determined, I'm just going to use some rough numbers here. So it's worth about 122000 She had like 96000 that she owed on it. So there was a little bit of equity in there. And, but it would still take like 90 days to sell. You know, so there's all these things. So I asked them, you know, how much money they needed. Uh, I think they needed like four or $5,000 for the funeral. They're like, well, look, we just need four or five grand to go ahead and, you know, cover the cost of the funeral. We don't care about anything else. You know, we just can't afford to come out of pocket to do that. So I said, all right, look, if we can do that, when we end up doing the deal subject to the existing mortgage, we we're able to go ahead and do it. The FedEx contract's up on Wednesday. I signed them on Wednesday night. I FedEx back the contracts on Thursday, got down there on Friday. They recorded the contracts, and she passed away on Friday. 
Oh wow! Oh wow! So it was a re- it was a real time sensitive, short term deal on that, um, and we were able to help them. Now I didn't tell anybody I did the deal, and then like a week later when we flew down for the funeral and everything, uh, you know I've never been thanked so much for doing a real estate deal because it would have been a huge burden on their family if they had to pay for the funeral, right? They didn't have the funds to do it. It was this whole big thing. And they, like, drove me all around town to go to the attorney's office to go do this. And it was just – I've never been thanked so much for doing a deal. We were able to turn around and get that property sold on a lease option to a Mm -hmm. family that couldn't afford to get into a property. We were able to get them 100% financing through a little government program. So they were able to get funded, and they were able to buy it six months later. Now, we made money on the deal, but it's only because we were able to help them in that time crunch. And it was right? a win-win. Win. other people yeah. weren't able to do. Yeah, and, and yeah. you did. It was a win-win. It's so huge, just for our audience, and uh, if you could explain it quick, what's a, a subject to an elite option? If you can explain it to our audience. Sure. A subject to deal doesn't require money or credit necessarily. Now, in this case, we did put some money down to secure the deal, but we were able to take over their mortgage and make the payments. We got it approved by their bank that we would go ahead and do that and allow us to make the payment. So subject to is, in essence, we're taking over the existing mortgage and making the payments. The The bank has the right to call that note due if they so choose. Uh, but in this case, they chose not to do that. Mm-hmm. And then a lease option, the simplest and easiest definition for that is, you know, it's the ability to, with a rent to own, right? They're going to rent it for a while and be able to go ahead and then purchase it. So we allowed them to get into the property. They rented it for six months. They worked to make sure they could get their financing uh, and got their financing approved by a government agency. It took three months longer than we expected because the government's on a different quarterly cycle. Uh, But it still ended up working out for them. They were able to get into the deal. We were able to make money during that process. And one of the keys to that was when I did that deal, because, you know, I'm not from North Carolina, I bought that property site unseen from New York City. And I don't recommend people do that right out of the gate, but in the future you'll be able to do that, is to have the right team members. So I called around real estate agents. I must have gone through about 50 different real estate agents down there in the North Carolina market until I found the right one, one person that would understand creative financing terms. There was only okay. one out of 50 that actually understood that. And I said, wow. hey, here's, here's how I'm buying it. Here's how I want to sell it. Most people were like, you can't do that. I was like, thank you very much. Have a great day. Right? And talked to the attorney, said, hey, give me somebody else. And went around, and I finally got a hold of this lady, uh, Jane, and she was like, yeah, my dad's an investor. Oh, we sell properties like that all the time on lease options. I said, great. And she goes, oh, by the way, in North Carolina, real estate agents aren't allowed to be paid commission on rental income. So I said, oh. okay, but you're going to rent it for a little bit and then sell it. She goes, yeah, it gives me even more motivation to sell it, just so you know. So I was like, okay. You know, I'd gladly pay her commission on the rental as long as I was allowed, you know, if I was allowed to. But it gave her motivation to make sure that the deal got sold. So that I guess the frustrating part is just trying to find uh, an investor-friendly real estate agent. You know, uh, you know, you got like Michelle, my partner. You know, she knows these terms and all that. So that 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 helps. But for you, you had to call 10, 20, 30, 50 people to finally get one, and at the end, it turned out to be a, a win-win. That, I mean. Uh, those are good points that you make making, Hugh, uh, especially about just trying to help other people out. Yeah, and look, you know, a lot of people go into the – most real estate agents, you know, there's some crazy facts that 70% of real estate agents don't own their own home, right? 90% don't invest in real estate. Most people go into it thinking that they're going to become an investor, but a lot of people do it part-time, and, you know, they haven't just educated themselves. Some like working with investors and some don't. So it's just a question of finding the right team members. And we do that with a lot of, you know, our attorneys, our different team members. We want to make sure we interview them to make sure they're the right fit for us, not just Mm -hmm. take somebody's word for it that they're a good agent. Because they may be a great agent at listing a property. They might be a great agent at renting properties. 
But if they're not able to do what you need to do, then it's just a question of finding the right person. Right. Hugh, I wanted to ask you a, a question. In regards to your real estate business, um, are you just doing it by yourself or are you partnered with someone else? Or, you know, just give us a little feedback on that. Sure. So I have my own real estate investment company. Uh, and then I do partner with different people, investors, um, different team members. So we've got a nationwide group of 10,000 real estate investors that we work with on individual real estate transactions. If there's something that I feel I can bring value to, if there's something that we feel we can go ahead and make happen, uh, then you know I'm open to taking on partners or we, we, do, we do it alone. It just depends on the deal. Uh, and every deal is different. So if we're doing a, you know, when we go out there and we've created uh, hedge fund type deals where they're, they're private placement memorandums and essence many little hedge funds that we got to file with the Charity Exchange Commission uh, in all the different states that we're offering that, you know, we'll take on different partners. So, you know, small deals, we typically do them individually or we'll partner with one other person on it. But on the larger scale, when we get into those types of things, then we'll definitely create a separate company to go ahead and invest in. I'm just asking, you know, for the listeners out there, because there might be some people that are starting out and they want to get more familiar. And since, you know, you have um, an expertise in it, you know, it, it would give great insight as to how you operate your company. Yeah, so there's many different niches of real estate. That's what makes it so much fun. And it's never boring. Like, we just got brought a whole new concept. You know, in the last three months, I've had three different people come into my office talking about this new concept, this new trend in real estate. And so I've been learning that new trend. And so now I'll partner with them on some opportunities because they're the experts on it so that I can learn it. And I often talk about, you know, some people have time, some people have money. we got to find people that have the opposite resources that we do to go ahead and do that, but you want to be able to learn the process as you go through it. So eventually you won't need partners. Right? If you need to take a partner on in the beginning, because as, a, as our CEO says, you know, a partnership is the only ship that's designed to fail over time. Eventually, you know, you're <laughs> going to get into a conflict with the other person. Eventually you're not going to see things the same way and you're going to end that partnership. So during that process, you need to learn those skills. You need to learn the, uh, the ability to be able to stand on your own. And that's the only way that you should go into a partnership is knowing that it's going to be temporary and eventually you will exit from it and go your separate ways. So you recommend, I guess, for newbies to partner up, uh, even if, it, like you said, short term, uh, you learn things together, you, 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 you try to minimize mistakes, but in the, in the long term, at least you have, you know, you got two people working together and you're learning as you go, right? Is that, you recommend something like that? The way that I learn best, um, there, there's two ways, right? I, I want to get trained and educated on how to do it so I can save myself time, energy, and money uh, and get myself plugged into a system. And then if I feel I don't have all the skills necessary, then I'm going to find somebody that may have the skills, partner, mentor, depending on what the relationship is, I want to find that. Um, and that's going to cost some money. Either that's going to be a part of the deal or that's going to be you paying somebody for training to get that because nobody's going to do that for free. Nobody's going to be like, hey, come follow me around for free, right? It's, it's, it's use of their time. So you've got to be able to as assimilate that knowledge, and there's a couple of ways, right? Training and education is a great way to do it, and then getting mentors to, to support you through that process or potentially – Come part of a group and then become part of those deals so you can learn as you go through that. If you were to start all over again, what would you do differently this time around? I think in the beginning I wasn't willing to ask for help, right, because I didn't know that many people in the real estate industry. Like we run a group of investors here in the New York tri-state area, over 250 of them locally. Uh, I didn't know that there were that many people out there doing real estate at that time or that I can get the information. So it would be to surround myself with more people that were actually doing what I wanted to do uh, versus trying to go out there on my own, right? 
And that's why I was paying for that training program to learn how to speak, right, to ask for money, those types of things. I was searching for it. And oftentimes when we're searching for it, you know, um, you get the information that you want. And that then now, nowadays with the Internet, uh, that information is, is more readily available than what we used to have to do to find the information, mm-hmm. right? Um, actually having to, you know, sit down with people and have that ability to meet more people quickly. And so that's definitely what I would do different is be able to go out there and get the information faster. Uh, back then, you know, you had to go to physical meetings to get the information. Now a lot of the content can be delivered electronically to people to gain that knowledge. And then it's just surrounding yourself with people that are successful in the industry and, you know, just hanging out with them. I mean, that's what I did in corporate America. I always hung out with people two levels above me because just to hear the way they talk, just to see the way they think is different. And same thing when I got into the real estate industry, same thing when, you know, I was asked to train. I always hung out with the more seasoned trainers, listened to the way they presented, listened to the way they talk, and just followed what they did because you pick up more just from hanging around those people, right? Mm -hmm. Hanging around a community of people, of investors, uh, getting together with them every week is you're just going to pick up little tidbits. You're going to pick up little golden nuggets inside conversations with those people versus, you know, showing up once a month or, you know, blowing off a meeting of, of just the investors getting together, even if it's just having fun. Because those little side conversations are where all the little golden nuggets come out. What separates the achievers from the non-achievers? What is it that that gives those guys, you know, uh, you know, the shoes, the red skis, the edge that somebody might not have or, or doesn't want to have, uh, what separates that, that line? Sure. There's two things uh, in my opinion. Now everybody's got something different, but in my opinion, there's, there's two things. Uh, it's being consistent and never quitting. So there are people out there that are, you know, definitely smarter than I am, more talented than I am, better at raising capital, better at each one of the things that I do. But, you know, as far as being consistent uh, with it, you know, people always know that they can come back years later, right? I've got students from 10 years ago. They know I'm still here doing real estate. You know, it's not a fad. It's not something we're doing. They know if they need to get in touch with me where I'm at. And same thing. I've got people that have been stalking me online for seven years and finally like, okay, you know what? I'm ready to work with you. I'm ready to get started. Why? Because they see that consistency. That consistency builds a lot of security with people and knowing that you're going to be there, right? You're going to be there every week. You're going to be there every month. You're going to be there. You just get consistent, right? There isn't an option not to show up. And people can be more talented than you. They can have more skills, more, you know, natural skills. They can learn more skills over time. But if you're consistent and you keep doing the work that's required each and every day, each and every week, that turns into each and every month and each and every year, and you start moving forward. What we see is a lot of people become inconsistent. They do it for a little bit. They stop for a little bit. Life gets in the way. Then they come back and they do it a little bit, and they become then something else happens. Sort of like pushing a snowball up a hill, right? As you push it up, right? as long as it's moving, it's easy to keep it moving. But once it stops, every time it stops, it's harder and harder to get it moving up that hill. And eventually you reach that top, if you're being consistent with it, it starts rolling down the other side, it starts picking up steam, and that's where your business takes off. Right. But if you keep stopping and starting, stopping and starting, it gets harder and harder every time to restart. So just staying consistent, doing the actions you need to do on a day-to-day basis, acting based on your goals and not on how you feel that day. A lot of people act on how they feel. Oh, I don't feel like doing that today. I don't feel like doing this today. It's not a question of how you feel. The question is, is it moving you closer to your goal or further away? If I don't place the ads, if I don't make the phone calls on real estate, I'm not going to be moving closer to my goal. So I have to do it no matter how I feel. And then just not quit it. You know, right. There's a lot of people that quit so close to success. They almost got a real estate deal done. They almost got their $10,000 check, and then they quit because of the ups and downs and the emotional roller coaster. And being able to stick through it no matter what 
to be able to continue to do that, continue to move forward. And to just say, I'm never going to quit on this. Never quit on yourself. Other people might doubt you. Other people might have it down. But if you know what your goal is, you're going to be able to achieve it. Great answer. Thank you so much. Um, and one more question here on my end. Um, what are you reading now? What books you recommend? I'm always uh, fascinated by what entrepreneurs read. There's two things that I've been reading. Uh, the first one is uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Uh, we're doing I heard a of that big pro- Yeah, we're doing a big project with the Statue of Responsibility. They want to build a statue the same size as the Statue of Liberty on the West Coast. Uh, Viktor Frankl is a Holocaust survivor. He talks about how people survive the concentration camps, right, and what kept people going. So when we talk about never quitting, right, what kept people going during that process, right? How were they able to keep themselves motivated? How were they able to keep themselves going? In some of the worst conditions anybody's ever been in. But Victor Frankl always thought, you know, there's lots of statues with a hand reaching up, but there aren't many people reaching down to help other people. Mm-hmm. So we decided to get involved and commit over $100,000 uh, in donations from our team to the Statue of Responsibility and people can have their name on the statue, just like the Statue of Liberty. You guys can have your name on there as part of that. Um, you just go to best, B-E-S-T, dot statue of responsibility dot org, and um, <clears throat> you'll be able to go right on there. You'll be able to learn. Victor Frankl says, you know, the Statue of Liberty is about freedom, but without, if we don't have responsibility, we don't take responsibility for our freedoms, we're going to lose them. So we need also to be responsible for our own financial situation, take responsibility for what's going on in the world, take responsibility for our actions. And you guys can go right on there and make a donation, uh, a $10 donation, a return $10 donation a month will get your name on the statue of responsibility when it's built, just like the people that have their name on the Statue of Liberty. All right, great. So that's one Thanks. book. And then the other book that I, uh, I'm actually reading right now is uh, Pitch Anything by Orrin Klaff. It talks about how when we make presentations and those types of things, how we need to present the information a little differently. All right, great. Those are great books that we'll definitely uh, look up. So Hugh, um, for all of the listeners that are out there, where can they find you? There's lots of different places, but let me go ahead and uh, do it the easiest way. You can go to Study Foreclosures with an S at the end, studyforeclosures.com, or you can send an email to Hugh at Hugh Zaretsky, Z-A-R-E-T-S-K-Y.com. So, uh, Willie, where can the listeners contact us? Find us on iTunes. Just, put, uh, just click on iTunes, work your money. You can find us at uh, workingmoney.net, which is our website. You can find us on Facebook at workyourmoney, um, facebook.com slash workyourmoney. And if you're an entrepreneur that wants to get on the show, just email us at workyourmoneypodcast at gmail.com. Also, we're on Patreon, and that's uh, uh, a website where uh, we could take donations to keep the show going. If you like the show, uh, just find us on Patreon. Uh, and just click on uh, or just type in work your money, and you'll find us also. Thank you, Hugh, for being on our show. Cool. Is, is there if I, uh, for those people that go on and, and donate on the Patreon, uh, mm-hmm. we are about ready to re- release our second book here. With, ah, okay. Um, uh, some of our real estate investors uh, from across okay. the country. And, you know, we can go ahead and definitely give a, a free copy of that uh, ebook to them. For those people that go on there, uh, make the donation for there or the Statue of Responsibility. If you guys go on there, make a donation. Yeah, we definitely want to have you back um, another time. Maybe we can discuss um, more in the real estate. Maybe we can have discussion on that the next time. So everyone, I want to say have a good evening. Until the next time, good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Hugh. Thank Thank you. Thank you.